Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, and I think you can remember the rest. So uh, that was nice, uh, uh, my brother. So anyway, let's um, proceed. So today we're looking at attackers and uh, their tools. It's very short and uh, direct to the point. Um, so the main thing we're going to look at, we're going to explain how network threats have evolved. We're going to describe the various types of uh, the attack tools. Yeah. And so uh, we begin by having an understanding of what a threat, a vulnerability, and a risk. What are, what are these? So uh, a threat, <coughs> so in most cases, attackers want to access. Uh, what what attacks, attackers want to gain access to is mostly data. Uh, and of course, intellectual property forms part of uh, data. Can be in form of software, you know, um, art, um, designs, and so on and so forth. It can be in form of research. You've done some research, some writing, you know. Uh, they want to access servers. They want to access computers, smartphones, and so on and so forth. Yeah, those are those constitute uh, the assets. Yeah, and then a threat. A threat is uh, that which you know um, endangers the assets. Yeah. And then the vulnerability will be the loophole within that uh, gives access to the threat actors to gain access into your systems or assets and be able to you know get access to the assets. Yeah. So a threat is the actor. Yeah. So we'll be looking at that. So here we have a definition of what a threat is, and a threat we say it's a potential danger to an asset such as data or the network. Then the vulnerability is just the weakness within the system. The attack surface is a collection, a sum, a sum of uh, the vulnerabilities that uh, exist within a system. Yeah, that an attacker can access. We refer to all that as an attack surface. Um, an exploit. This one will we will take it to be um, uh, an ingenious uh, way of uh, you know. Uh, uh, leveraging on the existing vulnerabilities to gain access to the assets yeah so an attacker will use an exploit to you know gain access to the assets that he wants to or, or that the attacker wants to access to um, so exploits may be remote or local yeah so a remote exploit is one that works over a network so the attacker doesn't have to be physically on site so but you can use um, the network to remotely access the resources but then there we have uh, some exploits that need the attacker to be physically on site and so the attacker will maybe have to carry out some sort of social engineering and you know some sort of deception to physically gain access into uh, the site that of course he wants to uh, extract some asset from and then we have a risk <coughs> and the risk is um, it's just a likelihood that a particular threat will uh, exploit a particular vulnerability of an asset yeah so after you've looked at the existing vulnerabilities then you identify the kind of risk uh, the, the kind of threat that that, that might be used against uh, those vulnerabilities and that constitutes what we call a risk um, so we have uh, different ways to manage risks. We call them uh, risk management strategies. So we have like four. The first one is uh, risk acceptance. Uh, the second one is risk avoidance, risk reduction, and risk transfer. So maybe you might also ask. So there's a whole discussion, or a, this is a whole topic, but in this case, we're just like having a summary of it. So. Um, because we're talking of vulnerabilities, risk, I don't know, and whatnot, which it's nice to also, I mean, get to understand if you have risks, then how do you manage the risks? So with risk as acceptance, when the, uh, when the cost of risk management option is, uh, is too high uh, compared to the cost of the risk, then we just accept the risk. You know, we can't manage the risk. The, we, we don't have the means of uh, managing the risk. So we just let it be. 
yeah we just accept say okay fine we don't have means of of, of managing this ex the existing risk because you know financially we can't or it might be in terms of uh, human resource uh, we don't have uh, the uh, 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 we don't have uh, the personnel with the uh, technical uh, prowess to you know uh, handle that kind of a risk so until we get one we just wait you know so that's like risk acceptance you don't take any action you accept it the way it is and you even let everyone know that yay uh this is the existing risk and uh you know we don't have any way out right now and then we have risk avoidance this means that uh, you put mechanisms in place to avoid incurring that risk or getting exposed to that risk by eliminating any possible uh, um, activity that might result to uh, that risk. Yeah, so that's called risk avoidance. So we put in place mitigation uh, 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 strategies to ensure that by, by no means that risk occurs. Yeah. And then we have risk reduction and uh, what risk reduction is it's um, I, I, sometimes it, I get confused between a risk avoidance and risk reduction because if you're doing risk avoidance then <laughs> what are you basically doing are you not also doing risk reduction yeah but uh, it's most commonly used uh, risk mitigation strategy and it requires careful evaluation of the costs of loss the mitigation strategy and the benefits gained from the operation and activities uh, that risk. Um, maybe if among us two, if there's anyone who got a better explanation of this, maybe you can let us know. But uh, when, when you're doing avoidance, in one or the other, you are reducing risk, you know. So, <coughs> yeah, someone wants to say something? Okay, fine. And then I think reduction yeah. has some element of acceptance, but doing something about it. Okay. Like, okay, I accept I may have risks, so I'm going to have an antivirus program. Mm -hmm. But avoidance is, I will do away with that subject. I will even do away with it. If, for example, um, uh, if, if perhaps I want to implement MFA, mm -hmm. and if MFA has some strings attached, perhaps there's some uncertainty about it, I refuse to use MFA. Mm -hmm. So I, I won't even put it in my system. I'll do, do, perhaps look for another option, but I'll, I will not even engage. Mm -hmm. But reduction is me accepting that MFA and doing something about it. Okay, okay. Then I'm like, okay, so I'm doing MFA. Can I, can I even have also uh, a, a redundancy for it? So I'm accept, I'm accept, I'm accepting that risk, mm -hmm. but there's some conditions. Um, so like, 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 because you see when you say this acceptance is saying. Um, there's a risk. I can see it. I, 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 perhaps it is perhaps very, very minimum. Mm -hmm. Then I'm like, you know what? I will take it. No harm. <laughs> but no action. There's no action at all. I'm just saying, okay, there's a risk of many students um, accessing, uh, being able to access to maybe more than one laptop if they, if you have a BYOD. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking, ah, it's, a, it's a low risk, so they can log in as many devices as they want. But now avoidance is saying, ah, ah, if I have many people who are accessing, then it means uh, this option will uh, expose me to a greater threat. So I'd rather do away with that BYOD entirely. So they, uh, they don't have BYOD. The reduction is saying, okay, I have BYOD, I need this service, but I'm going to perhaps implement a SIM to monitor the devices in my... So I'm going to take it, yes, but I'll minimize it. I'll do some... There's, there's some little thing I'll do to reduce the risk that I've taken mm -hmm. with this with this uh, with this system, mm -hmm. and then risk uh, with this perhaps uh, a service, and then of course risk transfer be, be, uh, uses decides I accept this risk, but I also it to someone else to to care for their the reduction part of things. Yeah. So I'm outsourcing the entire headache to someone else's table. Let me just pay them, let them deal with it at that point. Awesome. So um... I think that would mean that. Yeah, so so risk avoidance we can we can also refer to it as risk uh, elimination. Yeah, like you're too. totally eliminating the risk, right? Yes. Yeah, some sometimes I think interchangeably they uh, replace. I mean, same though. Yeah, you can make a case for each of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we totally eliminate the uh, the risk, and uh, yeah, we're good. And you've given a good examples of BYOD, and uh, yeah. Um, 
yeah for, for example if you install a malware it doesn't totally mean that you are you 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 if not not a malware if you install an antivirus on in your pc or in your systems it doesn't mean that you are totally secure from attacks malware attacks because uh, but but yeah. to a larger extent you have uh, reduced um let's say the attack surface yeah so that's like risk reduction from uh, some other sorts of attacks yeah but that doesn't doesn't mean that you are uh, totally foolproof from uh, being attacked at the end of the day okay and then risk transfers as you've said you're transferring the risk to someone else you're letting someone a third party handle uh, the risks for you it can be an insurance uh, company for example <laughs> yeah so if we undergo this kind of loss because of an attack uh, we are not going to be uh, liable you're going to you know handle everything or you hire a security company to be in charge of uh, uh, to secure your infrastructure so you are not in charge of uh, security directly but uh, a third party is in charge so in case of any sort of attack uh, part of the SLA is uh, you're not going to incur any charges it's the uh, the security uh, company you hired to secure you that's going to you know uh, pay for all the losses that you incur in the course of uh, you running your business so that's risk transfer someone else handles the risk for you okay great uh, it's, it's nice you get to really understand that um, yeah, so some common terms like countermeasure, what is a countermeasure? Just actions that we take to protect assets by mitigating a threat or uh, reducing a risk. And then the impact is like the outcome, the potential damage uh, to the organization as a result of the, uh, uh, of the threat uh, having, you know, uh, done the thing. Um, yeah, so that is it and then we have the hacker versus the threat actor which is like the main uh, area of discussion today so we just want to understand who is a hacker uh, um, I just want you to know for those who are still who are, who are new to this field and uh, you're getting to uh, we're introducing you into the world of uh, uh, security uh, digital security or cyber security for the first time through this course maybe we, we, a hacker is not a bad person but uh, I mean nowadays we when someone hears a hacker I mean it has that cor correct uh, you no know, direct uh, correlation with a bad person yeah who hacks systems for malicious intent but initially hackers used to be nice guys who used to you could call them researchers yeah so they hack to for the for, for for the sake of just uh, getting to understand how systems work, and then in the course of their hacking, they become more creative in terms of improving the systems. Yeah, but then nowadays it's like a person who hacks a system to steal or to do a bad things. Yeah, so a hacker has a variety of meanings, and uh, uh, the first one is a clever programmer capable of developing new programs and making coding coding changes. To existing programs yes introducing the creative element and of improving software and then uh, uh, we can also refer a hacker to be uh, a network professional that uses sophisticated programming skill to ensure that networks are not vulnerable to attacks yeah and then it can be an individual who runs programs to prevent or corrupt data on uh, to co to corrupt or corrupt data on servers so that that's like a bad guy yeah and so we have this general three uh, classification of hackers we have white hat hackers gray hat hackers and black hat hackers the white hat hackers we say that these are good hackers that protect systems it can be like the number one and the number two here uh, we talked about the clever programmer and whatnot but they their hacking is for good yeah to improve system to make systems more robust you know in terms of security and whatnot and then we have the gray, gray hat hackers. These ones fall in between, uh, depending on the motivation. Depending on the motivation, I mean, they can sometimes do good and they can sometimes do bad. So they are in between. Yeah. 
and then the black hat hackers these are just the malicious guys they do the hacking for money and whatnot yeah and they destroy people and they destroy systems you know using their skills so basically that is what it is so white attackers they are ethical uh, gray they are in between not so ethical not you know unethical or ethical depending on the situation and then the black attackers of course they are totally unethical um we can go through the history of hacking that thing started in 1960 with phone hacking and whatnot you know people used to hack phone signals the phones that used to exist back then you know to threaten people and stuff like that but you can go through that um so there are types of uh, actors and uh we have what we call script kiddies vulnerability brokers activists cyber criminals and state sponsored uh, hackers um or threat hackers so script kiddies this these are people people say it, uh, sometimes we'll say they are teenagers but they don't necessarily have to be teenagers you can say they are guys who are still uh, who don't have who are not that skilled yeah so they use most of the tools they use are uh, uh, script scripts that have been made by the more advanced uh, hackers um so they just run the scripts because anyone can run the script so we call them script kiddies and most of the times they result to a lot of harm because uh, they don't know the limits of uh, you know when to use the script when not to where to run uh, some of those scripts they can yeah they can even expose themselves while uh, doing the the hacking at the end of the day and then we have uh, vulnerability brokers uh these are gray attackers who attempt to discover exploits and report them to vendors for prizes or rewards yeah, so they look at your system i don't know we, we have zero day uh the, the zero day hackers those ones who just go to look at the existing systems to identify vulnerabilities and whatnot those vulnerabilities that even the owner of the system doesn't know yeah so when they those the on those vulnerabilities are discovered they refer to those vulnerabilities as zero day vulnerabilities so the vulnerability brokers uh, uh, fall under that category and they don't, just don't look at any system their systems well when you get a vulnerability and you report no one cares and no one pays you anything but we have those sensitive systems of serious organizations who really appreciate when uh, you encounter a vulnerability or as long as you are able to break down and clearly explain to them how you approached it and how they can you know uh, work towards uh, you know uh, doing, doing away that vulnerability then they'll pay you for that Activists, these are people who have an ideology. They want to um, get it out to the world. Yeah, so we call them activists. They're also part of grey attackers. So they'll rally and protest against different political and social ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like activists, like, but activists in this case, because they use digital platforms for that matter. We have cyber criminals, and uh, from from the word itself, these are just black hat hackers. They are not in for good, but they are in for bad. Yeah. So when you hear of uh, cyber cyber crimes that have taken place here and there, those form part of the cyber criminals. And anyone who maybe use a digital platform to hack a bank, that's a cyber criminal. Um, and nowadays even it goes to an extent of uh, those people use social media to uh, to bully others they also form part of the cyber criminals and so on and so forth. and then we have got the state sponsored actors or uh, hackers um so we know of uh, nowadays uh, we have cyber war and each and every government also arms itself with uh, its uh, machinery of uh, cyber hack uh, of of uh, of hackers so those guys we call them state sponsored uh, hackers because the government uses them to to gather intelligence you know to bring down systems of uh, other nations for example russia and uh, ukraine <laughs> sorry to mention the two as an example yeah so each has of course um, a team of hackers who target their other nation to either gather information or to bring down 
uh, critical uh, systems and so on and so forth uh, yeah um, I don't think if uh, there is need to go through that uh, some of the cyber security tasks so you as a cyber security engineer what are some of uh, your tasks um, so one is uh, so f first of all you, you, you will be interested with ensuring that uh, um, all assets that uh, you buy all assets that the organization acquires i mean they will be going through you you'll be the one advising them so you have to ensure that the vendors who give you uh, most of those uh, it uh, based uh, resources that you need be it in form of software or hardware that they come from a trusted uh, vendor yeah because uh, lately we have had um what's this sort of hack um supply chain sort of attacks we've had so many of those yeah so you need to ensure that uh, your your vendor is uh, you, you you trust your vendor that uh, they'll supply you um, good software they'll supply you good hardware not one that will introduce um, uh, uh, will increase the attack surface uh, in your organization and but we have security uh, of course secure software and then uh, you always have to ensure that your software is up to date, it's secure. Yeah, so that's one of you, another task of you, yours in the organization. Another one is to ensure that uh, we have regular penetration tests in your organization. Yeah, you don't just do you don't just do penetration tests after you've been hacked, but uh, it should be something that you do regularly to ensure that your system in one or the other is uh, uh, secure. And then backup, backup, backup of your data, you know, locally on your hard disk or in cloud, yeah, you need to have that. And then doing periodically, periodically to change Wi-Fi passwords to ensure that you don't use the same, same password year in, year out or across the year. Maybe you change it after a number of months, you know, depending on the usage. Uh, and developing uh, security policies is also part of the things that you have to do as a cyber security uh, expert develop so you're the one who comes up with the policies and you ensure that the, inf the, the, the policy is being implemented across yeah, to enforce the implementation of uh, the policies too okay and then we have what you call indicators of uh, compromise. W what do you what what enables you to tell um, whether you've been hacked or not? Yeah. So that thing that 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 will tell you whether you've been hacked or not. That's what you call an indicator of compromise. So these are just like pieces of evidence that uh, are left behind by an attacker that uh, will you 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 as a, as a forensic analyst will be able to look at and and tell whether you were attacked or there was an attempt yeah whether the attack was successful or not also you will be able to gather that from the indicators of compromise so these are just pieces of evidence left behind by an attacker um so remember that any bad guy visiting any site any crime site always leaves behind something yeah there's a uh, yeah um so indicators of compromise can be features that identify malware files, it can be IP addresses of servers that uh, are communicating with your system. Uh, you, you can also can also be able to see some files, you know, and so on and so forth. And even pieces, some 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 software running, yeah, some weird software running in your system that you did not install or that that, that did not come with the operating system. Yeah. So uh yeah, so the IOC are just pieces of evidence. So from the image here, you can see we have malware files, you know, some unique malware files, and uh, uh, some. When you look at your D DNS uh, um, log, you can see that uh, you have you have some weird uh, domains that were communicating to your system, some IPs, you know, and then. <coughs> 
besides indicators of uh, IOC, we also have indicators of attack. So this indicators of compromise, those, those just indicate, they tell you that you've been compromised uh, based on the evidence that you see. But then um, being compromised and being attacked, uh, what's the difference? Maybe I leave that to you. But an indicator, of, an indicator of attack will focus more on the motivation and the strategies uh, behind the attack. Yeah, what tools, what techniques were used. So this is what we look at. We don't just look at the evidence left behind. So indicators of compromise are those pieces of evidence left behind by an attacker that you can, you, you, you can when, when you gather, you can tell that, okay, we were attacked or you are compromised because the attacker left behind this and that and that, right? Uh, indicators of attack, <coughs> this, uh, you're just trying to establish the techniques used by the attacker uh, and so on and so forth, the strategies, yeah. So it helps to generate a proactive security approach that can be reused in uh, multiple contexts. So when you have this, maybe you can be well prepared in future to uh, defend against uh, uh, that same, same kind of attack. And then uh, we also in the, in the security community realize that uh, there is uh, sharing of information uh, in regards to this uh, sort of attacks. And we have a number of bodies that share information. So it's good that you also get vast, well versed with the, these different bodies that uh, share uh, this information. And I'll just give you one site. I hope this, by the end of uh, this course also we'll go to, we'll have a look at that site. We have the meter. Uh, framework so you'll get quite a lot of uh, uh, indicators of uh, compromise and indicators of attack and all that information a lot of information is shared and that platform is powered by the US government together with the MIT so they are really doing a great job in terms of gathering this data and putting it at one central location for everyone to access we also have bodies like CISA, AIS, ENISA and NCSA and so many, yeah, for European Union, for the US, and so on and so forth. So all these bodies, uh, what they do and what they do best is to share security related information so that we can all be prepared to handle this situation whenever they occur, wherever we are. Yeah, so it's a good initiative. And I think, uh, yeah. So threat actor tools, what are the tools that the threat actors use? Maybe we can just mention a few. I wish I could go to my Kali box to show you some of these tools, but uh, if you want to have a good overview of uh, most of these tools, they are well categorized. You can go to, I think it is, uh, let me see. Yeah, so we have a number of tools here. You can always come and see, I mean, if you want password cracking tools, uh, um, if you want network scanning tools here, yeah, and so on and so forth. So social, social engineering for MAC address uh, spoofing, you know, and uh, so on and so forth. For packet capturing, you can see why Shark and its friends down here can see a up and snort. Snort is an IDS and an IPS at the same time. Um, SQL map for SQL injection and stuff like that. Metasploit framework is a combination of different tools in one and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, John here for password cracking and so on and so forth. So um, it takes you time to really uh, understand all these tools but then you try to use them and see so we have for web 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 attacks and so on and so forth so we have so many tools listed here and the documentation and how to use you can always get that here i think they keep on updating the list but this is not an exhaustive list we have some more that uh, you can also use yeah so these are 
curly tools. Well, um, so just mention some of these tools, but uh, then it's up to you to, this course doesn't really go into details in terms of uh, using each and every of those tool. And uh, when it comes to tooling, um, you, you, you work with what, uh, work with what, uh, I mean, you're comfortable with, what you think gives you the, the results that you want. Because we have so many tools to do the same thing. Someone will tell you I use this, another one will tell you I use this. For example, someone will tell you I like using y -shark. another one will tell you I, I like using t -shark. Yeah, so it's really up to you to decide which one you want to use. Some are command line based, some are GUI based, and so on and so forth. Some are efficient at cracking passwords, for example, some are not, some can crack some types of uh, passwords, some cannot, you know, so it depends with what you're doing. So there's no tool that does it all. So it's, uh, you, are, you are very, you are efficient based on the type of tools you've mastered and you have in your toolbox. So you need to know your tools. Yeah. Great. Um, so attackers have tools. They use tools to hack. The same, same tools are the tools that uh, the security, uh, the guys at the security operation center also used to um learn about their systems because they can also do penetration tests to get to understand the vulnerabilities that exist in their system and uh, and then later on, you know, uh, try to uh, come up with safeguards against those. So, I mean, both, both, both parties use the tools, so it can be used for good or for bad. So it's totally, uh, now it's a, it's a thing that you decide what you want to do with. Um, and there are so many tools, by the way, for different things, for network, penetra uh, penetration testing, um, for, for web, web application testing or hacking, for operating system hacking, and so on and so forth. So it just depends with what you want to do and you pick the right tool for it. Yeah, so you can't say that you can master all tools. No, just need to know, you, need, you just need to know uh, when, when I'm faced with this problem, what tool should I go for? And you need to try a number of those. Some are open source, some are not, yeah. So we have password crackers. You can just like put them into categories. We have password crackers, wireless uh, hacking tools, and then network scanning tools, packet crafting tools, sniffers. We have root kits. We have, uh, call them fuzzers <laughs> uh, to search vulnerabilities. Uh, and so what are password crackers? from the term itself, you know, we use those to crack uh, passwords and a good example is John the Reaper and off crack. Yeah, so you, you get salts for uh, pass, password salts and then you want to crack those, you feed those into John and John will do the thing. You can, all, you can even use off crack. So, and also what you have to look as, if you can tell which algorithm was used to develop the hashes, then you might also narrow down the, the type of tool used because some of these tools cannot crack all sorts of uh, hashes yeah, because the algorithms are different and some lack the ability to handle some algorithms. And then we have wireless hacking tools. Use those to hack wireless networks. You know, um, we have Aircrack and G, Kismet and so on and so forth. And then of course, uh, and we looked at wireless, we have WPA, WPA2, and so on and so forth. You understand that WPA is not secure, and so most of these tools will do magic for you in terms of uh, cracking passwords in those uh, wireless uh, um, networks. But right now, with the advancement, again, most of these tools, you might get that they'll not work or they'll crack forever. So, but you go try. Yeah, at least for me, I tried at some point. And then we have network scanning and the hacking tools. Um, yeah, you want to scan your network, you want to understand the ports that are open, then the nodes that are down, those ones that are up, you know, you want to understand the network architecture that, uh, uh, yeah, of uh, whatever you're trying to scan. So use tools like Nmap and Superscan. And at the beginning of this course, we went through Nmap and you saw how powerful it is. It can do quite a lot of things. You can even inject scripts into it to do some other stuff yeah so you can even write those scripts and it will be able to 
do that for you. And then we have bucket crafting tools. <coughs> yeah, we also went through buckets and uh, you can modify buckets and we have tools that can help enable you to modify buckets. So we have a tool like HPing and Scrappy, you know, so they're used to probe and test the firewall robustness, yeah. So you, in one or the other, you can uh, try to craft some packets and see if the firewall is able to detect bad packets and good packets, you know, or it will let the bad packets in, stuff like that. So you can use it to like HPing and Scrappy. So while a network admin will reduce or a security personnel will reduce HPing to test the firewall robustness, a bad guy will basically use this tool now to to try to infiltrate your your firewall, you know. <laughs> so it works on either side. And then we have packet sniffers. Of course, you want to sit in between um, the communication and uh, you want to sniff to see what sort of communication is going back and forth. Yeah, so you, you ha we have tools that can enable you to do the sniffing, such as uh, Wireshark and TCP dump. Yeah, of course, what you're doing is just capturing the packets and then later on you're going to, to I mean, sieve through the packets to see what sort of communication was uh, taking place, more especially if the traffic is not encrypted. Okay, it's in plain text. And then we have rootkit detectors. And uh, um, you know what a rootkit is? It is, uh, it, it's a malicious software that, you know, um, the, I mean, um, I say, okay, rootkit detector. So a rootkit is uh, this sort of uh, malware that, uh, I mean, you can, you can say it's deceiving because it looks like a legit sort of uh, software, but it's not legit. Yeah. Under the hood, it's doing some bad thing. But on the outside, you look at it, it looks like a legit piece of software. Yeah, so that's a rootkit. Yeah. And uh, so a rootkit detector, basically what it does, it, uh, it looks at the directory and file integrity to see whether we have uh, any sort of uh, rootkit installed. Yeah. And then we have, uh, call them fuzzers, or some call fuzzers, I don't know. So we use those to search for vulnerability. I mean, what... So used by threat attackers when attempting to discover a computer system security vulnerability like skipped fish or wapiti and so on and so forth. Um, what for us do in simple terms, this I should be like a, a script that tries to ingest different types of input into a system, you know, uh, to see if, 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 the, if your system can handle some unique uh, inputs or if those inputs can break it something of the sort yeah we have forensic tools of course tools that we use to carry out forensics digital forensics like sleuth kit and helix you know how do you tell that the system uh, was used for hacking you know you want to try and trace see if we have some sort of evidence in the system so we have sleuth kit helix and so on and so forth that we use for digital forensics um, yeah, forensic tools are used by white hat hackers and Kali Linux. We have when you look at the Kali Linux tools, we have the forensics toolkit that has a combination of all those tools you can use. We have debuggers if you want to do reverse engineering, of course, you use a debugger. And sometimes, software engineers, we also use debuggers when you're writing code. You want to step through your code to see whether it is running accordingly, it's giving outputs as expected or not. We will use a debugger. On the other side, you use a debugger to get to understand how a piece of software works. And we have different types of debuggers like GDB and WinDBG. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, another tool common for reverse engineering. I think we call it uh, IDA. <laughs> there is IDA and then there's another one by NSA. Um, how am I forgetting the name? Ghidra. Yeah, you can also use that. Maybe plus some more. I mean, GDB is a command line based. I think also WinDBG is for Windows. GDB should be for Linux. Then WinDBG is the Windows version. 
for the same, but uh, that you just run on the command line. Okay. Uh, the IDA you mentioned and uh, Ghidra, those are GUI based, so you can use those ones. Well, we have hacking, I want to hack operating systems. We have, uh, we have uh, yeah, operating systems for hacking, of course, we have so many. So, or some of you know Parrot, Kali Linux, Linux, and so on and so forth. And then we have uh, encryption tools, uh, tools that can enable you to, uh, if, if we have any piece of data that has been encrypted, so you want to uh, decrypt it, so you can use tools like Veracrypt and Cephashid. Um, they have ha a combination of uh, uh, all those known encryption algorithms, yeah. So yours is just to feed in the 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 the, um, the cipher text, and then it will figure out what sort of uh, algorithm was used, and it can also go ahead and crack that. Yeah. And then we have vulnerability exploitation tools, tools that used to exploit vulnerabilities. We have a tool like Metasploit, and so on and so forth. Meta Metasploit is is a common one, and it's a combination of some other tools it's a toolkit on its own and then of course if you want to scan for vulnerabilities in your system you have so many tools to do that so it just depends what sort of system are you trying to web, to scan a web application a web application uh, an operating system you know yeah so a network so you can scan a network you can scan operating systems you can scan particular uh, one piece of software on its own you can scan a web application so we have tools that can do that. And the examples here, we have NIPA, Securia, and so on and so forth. We have other tools you haven't mentioned, which are very common, so. And then we have categories of attacks. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, we have different types of attacks that are being used by uh, uh, hackers. So you have like it's dropping, dropping attack someone just listens to your communication um or yeah you're talking to someone you're trying to pass some sensitive information and some other person is listening in that's called it's dropping data modification attack of course changing the data yeah uh so a attack captures enterprise traffic and alters the traffic so yeah has to be like some sort of man in the middle attack. So uh, he listens to your traffic he, he, and then he, he captures the traffic, he changes it and then he forwards it. Yeah. And then we have IP address spoofing attack. <coughs> um, so this one I am doing, what, what I'm doing is um, I'm giving myself uh, another IP that is not mine. Yeah. That's, and then I use that IP to uh, do some malicious thing, but in real sense, my IP, so my IP is masked, you know, so when you're doing ad IP address spoofing, you're masking your IP with, by giving yourself another IP. The same thing with MAC address spoofing. You're just masking your MAC address and you're giving yourself another MAC address. And then you have password-based attacks, of course, uh, when you obtain, when a threat actor obtains uh, credentials for valid user accounts and then uses those to uh, gain access into systems. We have denial of service attack, distributed denial of service attack. What you're basically doing, what the threat actor is doing is uh, denying the users of uh, the systems, access to those systems um, through various means, of course, by congesting the traffic, internet traffic. It can be by bringing down systems, you know, you crash the running the systems so that the users cannot be able to access those and so on and so forth. Man in the middle attack, I said, is sort of attack where the threat actor sits in between a communication between two parties and listens. Yeah, so just for the sake of stealing information. Compromised key attack, the threat actor steals uh, crucial keys that are used for accessing the system. It can be um okay um <laughs> we, we have what we call secret keys it can be a token and so on and so forth so once you get that you can be able to you know uh channel uh, redirect communication 
to yourself or access uh, uh, another user's account, the user's account because you have the key, the secret key. This is uh, so. This is even possible if the system leaks. You know, some systems leak keys. So if they do leak keys, then the threat actor can easily extract the key and and uh, and use it to access the communication that is going on or take control of the session. And then you have sniffer attack. <coughs> so, uh, of course, use of applications that are, have the capability to read, monitor, and even get copies of uh, the communication that is taking place. That's a sniffer attack. So I think we're done with this module. Unless someone has a question, I can start the other module, which is quite short. You guys have any question or I took you very fast. This the, the remaining modules are quite short and straightforward. There isn't so much of a practical a bit of it as you can see it's just uh, knowledge to uh, now give you an understanding of uh, what cyber security is and stuff. Yeah, maybe we'll have a few modules in future with some practical uh, aspects. And then that will be it. Great, are you guys there? I might be talking to myself. It's good I confirm. I can see you guys are, I can give you a break. Can I like give you five minutes break and then we also tackle this module. It's not that long. Promise to finish it within the shortest time possible. You can continue, uh, Sebastian, because of uh, this also going. Sure, sure. So we have common threats and some of the common threats and attacks So what you're going to look at here is uh, just describe some types of malware, explain reconnaissance, access, and social engineering network attacks, explain what denial of service, buffer overflow, and uh, the version attacks are. I can use this slide to explain everything if you allow me to. Um, but anyways, so first of all, what is the malware? <coughs> malware is... Uh, uh, can someone of you tell me what a malware is in brief? Because we've been mentioning it over and over. Well, so a malware is just a piece of software whose intention, of course, is not good. It's, uh, the intention of that piece of software is to cause destruction, to steal data, you know, to bring down systems. So there are different types of malware. Right? So you can say it's a code or software designed to damage, disrupt, steal, inflict, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it can affect host networks. Uh, so the three most common types of malware, we have virus, worm, and the Trojan host. Yeah, sometimes most most uh, most of uh, most of the time people confuse between a virus and a worm you know and the trojan horse yeah so um so what are viruses uh, these are just types of malware that spread by inserting a copy of itself into another program yeah so you can spread them by different mediums. You can use a USB, you can use a CD, a DVD. It can be in form of an email attachment. So once it gets to that co other computer via email or via USB, it replicates itself, it attaches itself to some program. Then uh, like that, like that, you get it uh, spread all over. Yeah. <coughs> so some viruses may install themselves some you might need to execute something to run some executable file for it to you know to 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 run yeah some are self executing some are not you have to execute some other program for for you to 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 basically just install them and run them um they don't have to be necessarily harmful yeah so sometimes they can be ha harmless but uh you can just fill up space in your PC, slow down your PC for no for no good reason. 
Uh, so you get that those programs are running, but they are, they, they are adding no value to you because they're just occupying memory space and, uh, and uh, you know, filling up space that could be used by other programs that you, are, you really need service out of, uh, out of them. And so you get that they slow down your PC because, or they slow down other programs because they've occupied both, you can say both uh, memory space and uh, CPU processes most of the CPU processes running their virus processes and uh, maybe the files so many files that fill your disk and so on and so forth and then you have Trojan horses these are malware in uh, software that appear to be legit but are not legit and I think I mentioned that before uh, they also have malicious code and most of the times you get that uh, we use Trojans to, you know, uh, to create some sort of, uh, um, forgetting the term, but uh, I mean, if you want to authenticate into a system by not going through the normal way of authentication, then backdoor, yeah. So you can use a Trojan host to introduce backdoor, uh, backdoors into us in, into systems. And so you get that the bad guy doesn't use necessarily need to use the normal way of authenticating into the system, but just uses the backdoor to access the system. So we use Trojans to introduce that. So they are found attached to games uh, and are used commonly, uh, are commonly tricked into loading and executing the Trojan horse on their systems. Uh, yeah. So they can cause immediate damage, provide remote access to systems or access to backdoor. So we have classification of uh, back of Trojan horses. So we have those that uh, fall under the remote access Trojans and those ones enable and authorize remote access. Yeah, so you access a system remotely. Um, and then you have uh, the data sending Trojans. Those ones, they just get into a system, they steal data, sensitive data, and they send it somewhere. Yeah, they just meant to send data to back to the uh, command and control center. And then you have those Trojans that cause destruction. Yeah, the this destructive Trojans, they corrupt or delete files in your system. So once you have those in your system, be assured that they'll corrupt your system, they'll delete your system, you'll just have like, to format your system completely. Yeah, and then we have uh, proxy Trojans, and uh, what happens with proxy Trojans is uh, they, um, so, I mean, they use the victim's computer as a source device to launch attacks, yeah, and that's why most of the times when uh, you're doing investigation, you're not supposed to, you, you don't just get any computer and you take that to be the source of truth because a bad guy might have just used someone's computer who is not a bad actor to you know launch attacks yeah so that computer we can we refer to it as a proxy computer because um it wasn't the real computer of the bad actor you know but the bad actor just used a computer of someone who did not have any bad intent to launch attacks you know okay and then <coughs> Yeah, and that, and, and that, so there was sometimes I asked someone a question. So if someone attacks you, do you attack them back? And my answer was, my, which was very wrong, the, my answer was yes. You know, if someone hits me and I have the ability to hit back, I can hack him back. But that is wrong because uh, the person who might have hacked me might have used a victim's computer, a proxy, a proxy uh, uh, computer to hack me. And so when I hack back, the person who suffers is not the real hacker, but just the victim who was being used as a proxy. Yeah. And so the concept of a proxy Trojan. And then we have FTP uh, Trojans. This uh, Trojans that enables an authorized file transfer services and on end devices. I think they can also fall under the data sending because how do you send data? You can send that through use of uh, FTP send files and whatnot. Um, we also have security software disabler and what this Trojan does is just to disable the security of a system. Yeah. Uh, if you have your antivirus running and whatnot, you get that this software disables that. And then you have the denial of service. 
uh, there are different types of denial of service, form of uh, slowing down the network and, and uh, I mean, um, it might be engaging your CPU, your, your RAM, you know, until the other normal programs are not able to run because the CPU is fully engaged running nitrogen uh, uh, functions or whatever. Yeah, in form of a network, you know, sending so many requests and stuff until the network is uh, crashes and other users are unable to use. So we have Trojans that do that. And then we also have Trojans that collect keys. When you're typing on the keyboard, it steals the keys that you are keying in and they refer to those as uh, keylogger Trojans. So we have uh, so many of those. Um, we also have worms. So different types of worms and I, just give you an assignment, maybe you go and try and see if you can read a number of uh, the different worms that we have in existence, although we'll, we'll briefly look at uh, some of those examples. Um, so I told you, some, most of the times worms are confused with viruses. Viruses, you know, viruses create a copy of themselves in a program, they attach themselves to a program. But then what about worms? Yeah, so worms replicate themselves by independently exploiting vulnerabilities in a network. Yeah, so they replicate over and over, over and over, uh, and they move across the network. Yeah, and by so doing, you get that it slows down the network and, you know, spreads across file systems and so on and so forth. Yeah, viruses need a host to run. So because they attach themselves to some sort of program in, uh, running in a host, but worms don't need that. So worms don't have to attach themselves to any host. Yeah, they can just exist on themselves and run, get across the network from one network to another and so on and so forth. And therefore they can spread across the world, across regions. Yeah, and like viruses, if you have to spread them, maybe you need some devices that, you know, like a flash, a USB, a, a USB, a DVD and so on and so forth to spread them across. Or you need maybe some medium like an email you know, to transfer them from one point to another, file attachments and so on and so forth. But worms don't really need those mediums. Yeah, they can run without a host program. Uh, but once a host is infected, the worm spreads rapidly in the network. So we have a good example of code red worm. Maybe you should go and read on that and uh, just see what happened within a span of 19 hours. We had, uh, I mean, that virus, that worm, sorry, spread across the world. So that is, uh, we had Mirai and so on and so forth. There's one that was used to attack the nuclear power plant in Iran. <laughs> um, what was the name of that? Maybe you guys can figure out. That was also another one. Um, yeah, we have SQL Slama Worm. Go and read on that. I told you also go and read on Code Red Worm. Uh, SQL Slam Worm. The concept is the same, but just see how the implementation of that worm and how that worm caused uh, issues. Um, yeah, and some one of the major uh, outcome of uh, the worm is, of course, the denial of service. Okay. So what does? Uh, okay, that's a video for it. Watch. So what, what a worm needs is uh, an enabling vulnerability. We need to have an existing vulnerability in form of, uh, you know, a network, you know, the, or in the software and so on and so forth. Yeah, so because it exploits an existing vulnerability, it looks for uh, the, the vulnerability. So if, if those vulnerabilities are not in existence, then that means that worm will not survive there. Yeah. Um, a propagation mechanism how is it going to get from point a to b so it needs that in place too uh, so after gaining access to a device the worm replicates itself and locates new targets yeah so it needs a way to get from point a to point b so the propagation mechanism and then a payload uh, it's just any malicious code that can result in some action um we refer to it as a payload I can, can just say that 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 piece of uh, of uh, assembled code that carries the, the the worm we can refer to that as a payload. 
So it carries the worm from point A to point B. So that becomes a payload. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so worms are self-contained, as we said before. Uh, so uh, and then it cops it it replicates itself yeah when, once it gets to a host yeah and you can't you can't really tell how it propagates itself so detecting its uh, propagation is difficult so worms never stop spreading on the internet after they are released worms continue to propagate until all possible sources of infection are properly patched so all you can do you can't clear them but you just need to patch all the uh, vulnerabilities that might be exploited by that that worm. So once you 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 ensure that uh, you've eliminated all those vulnerabilities that can be used by the worm, then you have eliminated the worm. That's the only way to go about it. And then we have ransomware is another form of mal of malware, of course, which just denies you access to your computer or your data because it introduces encryption that you have uh, no idea how to decrypt. You know how to reverse so it will encrypt your data and of course since it's a ransom someone will ask for some money eh? the owner of the ransomware will want you to pay money so that you can get your data decrypted so that you can make sense out of it again yeah um and that's why we insist that backup 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 data and just don't back up in one location ensure that you have uh, uh, some backups elsewhere maybe in the cloud and so on and so forth locally yeah um yeah how how how, how the malware ransom uh, ransomware spreads through emails and adverts and so on and so forth so you click emails you don't know where they are from and the links in there you're basically downloading and installing that ransomware in your pc or you're clicking onto on some sort of advert that really looks attractive to get to get to gain more insight and unknowingly you find yourself installing the ransomware in your pc all right um yeah and we have other types of uh, malware like scareware just uh, some software used by scammers to scare you maybe to threaten you to you know uh, dish out some sort of money <laughs> phishing attack this is just like um uh we send you for example, phishing emails where we send you emails so that whoever doesn't know that it's a, a it's a malicious email gets to you know click a link or uh, uh, you get to reply and you know uh, and you we start transacting with you you start giving us information about yourself and stuff that is phishing it's not directed to anyone but anyone who gets the email and is willing to respond. And then, of, of course, we, we've got uh, spear phishing, which is just directed to one person. So it's not like uh, we are going, you know, it's like phishing. We just throw a net, uh, the fish that is, uh, the, 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 the fishes, the pieces of fishes in there that, you know, feel like uh, <laughs> uh, they want to eat something and they see something uh, they are attracted to, they get there and then we hook them up. But then that's phishing. Yeah, anyone who doesn't know that it's a trap gets in. But spear phishing is directed. And then we have root kits. We've talked about those. You have spyware for you know uh, for information gathering, just for spying. And you can use a number of malware to do sp to do spying. Yeah, you can use Trojan host, adware, tracking, and so on and so forth. Keyloggers, all those form part of the spyware. Because what you're after is gathering information. A keylogger will collect the keylogs. Most probably you might be lucky to get a password combination in there. And, or whatever message someone was trying to type and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so some of the things, how do you tell that you've been uh, malware infected? Of course, uh, you'll see strange files in your, in your, in, in, in your uh, operating systems. You'll see some strange programs some strange desktop icons that uh, you did not uh, create or your pro the pro legit programs didn't create. Uh, you'll see and the antivirus and the firewall programs will be turned off, you know, uh, automatically without you 
without your intervention so if that happens then most probably you have some sort of trojan that is you know shutting down your antivirus and firewall so that it can be able to do other things without being detected we have uh, uh, your screen freezing you know and your system crashing over and over you get emails that uh, you did not subscribe for or you're not expecting uh, you have uh, yeah so so you can get email you can receive email or you can also you, you can also get that you send an email without knowing you know so how is it possible that you send an email unknowingly you know so a program sends an email on your behalf yeah and then you have um, files that have been modified or deleted you know maybe someone was trying to clear tracks after doing something uh, increased CPU and memory usage because I told you some of these programs be it virus or trojans and whatnot they when they are running they consume memory space and uh, the CPU yeah so when that happens then most probably you, that's when you encounter the freezing of the PC and whatnot and then problems connecting to network you know uh, uh, because of network congestion as a result of uh, that and then slow computer or web hosting speed and non-processor i think more or less the repetition to this bit here and unknown tcp and udp ports because we have some services that are running and you know communicating with unknown tcp and udp ports back to the command and control center and so on and so forth um Yeah, so before someone does a network attack, what they normally do, they need to do information gathering, and that's what we call RICO, and they can use a number of things to do that. They can use uh, existing web applications for the organization, they can use Google, yeah, and we have other tools that you can use to gather information about a person, especially maybe from uh, the social media uh, sites like Facebook and whatnot, uh, Instagram, so we can be able to gather information from those sites. So once we get the information, of course, we can use that information to, I mean, you can create fake badges to access systems. You can be able to use that information to uh, come up with password combination and so on and so forth. You can use that information for social engineering because you can easily create a fake badge, get to some organization with that fake badge, you know, convince people that uh, you are this visitor they expected because you saw on their site that uh, they are holding a conference or they'll be having visitors, I don't know from where. Yeah, so you come dressed like one with a badge. Most probably you know that they even don't know the face, how the face of their visitor looks like. So when you come, they'll totally believe you're the one with the badge and everything. So yeah, so basically those are some of uh, the attacks. Mm. Yeah, and you guys can go through that. Yeah, some of uh, Rico, uh, besides just collecting information on the web, can involve reconnaissance, can also involve uh, carrying out uh, a ping sweep. Uh, you do a ping, a ping sweep across a network just to gather information of the existing nodes uh, you can scan the po for ports to see which ports are up because once you see the ports that are open then you're able to know which kind of services the services are running because we also understand that uh, the these protocols um, are associated with some uh, kind of service like an email service a printer service and so on and so forth that's why it's good to do IP scans and port scans will be able to tell you which ports are open, uh, which IPs uh, the system is talking to and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, which IPs are in existence. Yeah. Vulnerability scanners, if you are collecting, gathering information to also identify the type of vulnerabilities that exist in the system, in the operating systems, um, uh, web applications and so on and so forth and you can use a combination of different tools it just depends what you are scanning and then of course after you have identified the vulnerabilities the next thing you can do you can exploit those vulnerabilities using exploitation tools like uh, metasploit netsparker and so on and so forth um, 
yeah you can watch those yeah, scanning the network using nmap i think we did that some time back uh, password attacks just will be collecting the hash hash dumps and then cracking those using cracking tools like john the reaper yeah uh spoofing attacks you can do ip spoofing or mac spoofing as we explained before um and then of course <coughs> we have trust exploitation attack where um the attacker has exploited one one, one node that uh, so node a is talking to node b and the attacker has compromised node b so he has full control of node b so whenever node a is trying to talk to node b uh, the threat actor or the attacker knows that uh, um, no, no, knows is aware of the communication and he can even redirect the communication not to go to node B but he'll pretend to be like node, node, node B and all the communication will get to the attacker or he'll simply get a copy of all the communication that uh, transpires between node A and node B and then we have uh, port redirection so that means that uh, instead of uh, the communication going directly to the intended party it is always redirected to it always goes through the attacker first before it goes through to the intended party yeah so the attacker does the redirection the traffic the traffic always has to go through the attacker and then the attacker forwards now the traffic that was intended for for node for the other node so from node a to node b but it doesn't go directly to node b the attacker ensures that all traffic gets gets channeled to the attacker and then the attacker forwards it to not be yes, some sort of man in the middle attack if you may ask me yeah so here you have man in the middle who sits in between the server and the communicating uh, nodes so the nodes that are communicating to the server the back and forth communication between the server and the node so the, the attacker sits in between and listens and is able to gather all the uh, communication from the sessions buffer overflow attack can be in very in different forms can be in form of uh, overwhelming the overwhelming the existing uh, processes like the cpu or the ram you can call that the buffer overflow or it can so in, by, by sending so many requests that the the cpu or the the ram cannot handle so it can result to buffer overflow alternatively buffer overflow can be uh something that is that results from uh, a flawed program a program that has a flaw so where the engineers did not like uh clearly uh, uh clearly handle uh, uh space in terms of uh, data storage so you get that the data that's being being sent for storage the data structure is not able to handle that data that data is quite huge yeah in form of a, of a network we can have a buffer overflow in our network in, in, in the sense that the attacker sends uh, huge packets yeah and abnormal packets yeah we had a name for that jumbo is it jumbo what packets forgetting the name yeah so the packets are too huge not normal packets yeah so that you can also say that's a buffer overflow in the network yeah um social engineering attacks quickly what they are we have what called pretexting uh so the attacker just pretends to need personal information or financial data from you and pretends to be a legit person asking you for your personal information the attacker might say that he works in the bank and some need some of your uh, personal information to be able to help you i don't know uh, fix one or two three things that is identified which of course is not true and then if you believe that if you trust him or you trust the the bad guy then you end up uh, sending your information and that's how you get compromised and then you have phishing attack i think that was mentioned uh, just an attacker sends fraudulent emails uh, that look like real emails yeah they look legitimate then if you trust them of course you can click the links or you can share your information and whatnot spear phishing is 
form of phishing, but it's more of a directed email to an individual or an organization. A spam, we just refer to those as junk emails. Uh, so they might contain harmful links and malware and so on and so forth. We have this sort of attacks called something for something, where we all sometimes call quid pro quo, where a threat actor, I mean, uh, request you for some sort of information or for something in exchange for something. So it's willing to give you something so as to get a certain piece of information. We have baiting, we have impersonation, we have tailgating, of course, shoulder surfing and dumpster diving. And I think you can go through those dumpster diving, just collecting information from the trash bins and whatnot, shoulder surfing, just viewing information over someone's shoulder getting when someone gets into a gate you follow through you know impersonation you pretend to be someone you can even put on uh, you can come up with a fake badge for someone else and you get in and so on and so forth yeah so we have what you call a social engineering yeah. toolkit and i think that one also comes with uh, kali linux so it has uh, uh, a, a number of tools for carrying out social engineering so uh, as an attacker i think um, attackers use that to carry out different types of social engineering um, and we can also use those ones in the enterprises to uh, just test our systems to see whether we are uh, secure from see if we are vulnerable to social engineering or not so when you run some of those tools you can uh, be able to tell the position of uh, your employees as to whether they are knowledgeable about uh, some of these uh, social engineering attacks or not and then you can train them accordingly based on the outcome and then uh, we have the weakest link and that means the employees you have in your organization are the weakest link and so if they are well trained then that means uh, to some extent you have eliminated some of the existing risks in your system um, So we have this denial of service attack and we have different forms of denial of service attack. Uh, we said it can be network based in form of uh, congesting the network with a lot of uh, requests that the server maybe cannot handle and then that brings down the network or it makes other users, legit users, unable to use the network. So we refer that as denial of service. Uh, it if it comes from one source, we just call it denial of service if it comes if the 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 the, the attack has been uh, orchestrated or automated from different sources then we can say that that is distributed denial of service and a good example can be use of botnets yeah to send so many requests to uh, a network or a server or a service that the service cannot handle and then it crashes the service so on and so forth and we mentioned buffer overflow we also have a version attacks and uh, where we install for example firewalls and intrusion detection system and intrusion prevention system hackers might want to come up with ways of uh, you know deceiving the ids the firewalls you know and we looked at some of the tools for example that can can uh, in one or another, another can manufacture some sort of uh, <coughs> uh, packets yeah and ingest those packets into the network so if uh, the IDS cannot be able to track those, uh, then that is a form of uh, a version attack. Or we can use encryption, for example, to ensure that we encrypt our bad traffic because the intrusion detection system and, the, and, and, and firewalls don't go through encrypted data. So we use encryption to, sne to sneak in bad traffic. So uh that's another form of a version attack so um yeah um yeah so use zombies bots and botnets to do distributed denial of service um You talk of encryption tunneling as a form of a version attack using using encryption and uh, um, 
you can also fragment traffic you break down your packets into smaller fragments and later on you assemble those because the smaller uh, fragments won't be the ideas will not look at the small fragments of uh, the packets that it wants to look at the packet as a whole you know so that be, it becomes difficult for it to make sense of fragmented packets yeah uh, then um, yeah you can also use protocols for different use cases other than what they were meant for and so that results to some sort of uh, protocol uh, level misinterpretation and uh, makes it difficult for the firewalls to you know um, imp uh, enforce the policies or the rules on uh, that kind of uh, misuse of uh, the protocols or you can use unknown protocols i don't know if you have unknown protocols do we i doubt we have traffic substitution you look at the traffic you remove some elements of uh, some 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 uh, some bits of the payload in the traffic so you eliminate some bits or you basically do the opposite you insert extra packets into the traffic you know and that gets through into past the firewall past the ideas without the ideas knowing yeah yeah you can read this i think we talked of proxies yeah uh, yeah, and I think that marks the end of this module because I just wanted to end at uh, exactly 4.30. I don't want to keep you here for long. And uh, that is it, unless uh, someone has a question. Well, if there's no question, then we meet tomorrow. Um, and then we proceed from where we left. So tomorrow, an announcement is tomorrow we meet at, uh, I said at what time? We meet in the morning at nine. Nine, we see if we can do like uh, two modules. And then of course, give you a break and then see if we can do some more two modules in the evening. Yeah. Just trying to ensure that we cover as many as we can. And then on Friday, we cover some more. By end of Friday, we should be like, uh, that's Wednesday. On Thursday, we cover some more again. We should be uh, like at number 20 something of uh, mo the modules. And then on Friday, we can see if we can finish everything. So that when you open the school, uh, you guys, your focus should be just to sit the exam, cyber ops if uh, you are ready, and then we call it a day. Otherwise, thank you for showing up. So you have a good one. Well, okay, sure. Hey, you taking what again?